Hi, my name is Sam. I'm on a mission to build the world's most sustainable locomotives using the power of steam. This week we're welding up one of the cylinders for the steam driven circulating pump. I take a ride on a triple expansion steam powered ship and I'm going to tell you what this is for. In the last video we had a look at how I was machining the weld prep on the plates for the valve chamber for the circulating pump. Now I've got a whole lot of uh, little pieces that I need to use the grinder for because they're just a bit fiddly for the shaper. There's some smaller but slightly heavier pieces so I'm going to give the shaper a go again for these in the hope that it will at least save a lot of noise um, if not time. This is one of the water end cylinder flanges and I've shaped this radius on one section and this lines up with the port in the valve chamber and the radius provides a smooth transition for the water as it enters and exits the cylinder. That reduces the resistance to flow and by smoothing that passage of the water into the cylinder the power required to pump a certain quantity of water is reduced. These small details all add up to a significant saving of steam. The long-awaited moment, finally going to start tacking the circulating pump together. So this is the water end, these are parts of the valve chamber, and I've got here a list, I spent a bit of time, worked out what order I needed to weld all of these parts together in, because a lot of the welds you can't get to once other parts are welded on. I've got to tack this assembly together, then I'll tack this onto the cylinder, and it'll start taking shape. So there we are, we have the first part tacked together. This is the suction valve chamber uh, for the water end of the pump, and the water flows into and out of the pump cylinder over this edge, like so. Got this all prepped up now, so time to fit the valve chamber to the cylinder. It's gonna take me a wee minute, I've got to carefully get this in position, uh, make sure it's accurate, reference back to these uh, port edges and then I can tack it on these corners here triple check it make sure it's exactly where it needs to be make sure it's straight and square and true to the cylinder and then gradually uh, fully weld um, all of it together I'm fighting a, an out of round pipe which is making life a little bit challenging It's not going to work, is it? Hmm. Oh. Okay. Break our tap. Oh, that, that hurts. I'm just putting the roots into these welds, but I need to complete both this weld and this weld because I can't access either of them when the flange is on. Hot fingers. Do with a new TIG torch. This one is hot. Very hot. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it is welded up nice and securely. So I'm just going to give that a light touch with the grinder to smooth it off so that it doesn't resist the flow of water going past it and then I'll be ready to 
weld the end flanges on. I've just carefully set this flange on the end of the pipe. And what I'm looking for is to line up the port, so the radius that I've put in the flange with the port. I'm quite happy with that position. I'm going to tack it from the inside with the TIG welder, and then I can turn it around, tack it, and weld it from the outside. Right, here goes. It got a bit late last night welding this together, so I'm back here the next day, but of course it's cooled down in the interim. We're going to give it a quick preheat with the oxy fuel so that the first welds I put in don't crack. 60 to 70. According to the list, the next part to build on is the dividing wall between the suction and discharge uh, valve chambers. So that part goes on here, and I've got to fully weld that on because I can't get to it once I've welded the other bits on around it. Okay, so a little snag while I've been welding this up. What happened is when I put these fillets in here and here, it's actually caused the pipe blank to shrink. Um, so where the welds are, that's shrunk by a whopping millimeter on each end. If it hadn't been that I accidentally specified the wrong flange blank thickness, so I spec 20 millimeters instead of what was supposed to be 16 millimeters, uh, but by coincidence, that saved me, because had I had these cut in 16mm, there would now not be enough length left in the cylinder to machine the, the ends of the flanges. But it has meant that my little filler pieces, which fit in here, uh, no longer fit in here. And I need to take about half, or just over half a mil off uh, this face, each end. And then I've made this tool, which allows me to line up the valve seat bores. These sections, these fillers, which cover in the sides of the valve chambers, when they've been water jet cut, the edges haven't been exactly perpendicular to the plate, which has meant, because I've used identical profiles for all of these, when I've machined the chamfer, uh, some of them have ended up slightly higher on this edge and some slightly lower. When I weld the next plate on, it's going to be slightly crooked which isn't the end of the world, but if I can put it in the mill quickly and just skim about half a mil off or maybe a millimeter off to bring them all back down level, it's going to make the next steps much easier. When I milled this, of course, I lost some of the chamfer, so I've corrected that with the angle grinder.
Just after New Year's, Dania and I spent a few days in Queenstown, which is about a six hour drive south of Christchurch. Queenstown is a tourist hotspot built on the shores of Lake Wakatipu, and on the lake there is a famous twin screw steamer, Ernstlaw. Built for New Zealand Railways in 1912, she has been plying the waters of Lake Wakatipu for over 100 years. Quite naturally, we took a steam powered trip across the lake because for me, the Ernstlaw offers a rare opportunity to witness a triple expansion steam engine in full flight, which apart from anything else, reminded me how quiet the power of steam can be. For the Ernstlaw, her triple expansion engine allows her to take full advantage of the cold lake water, extracting more power from the steam by expanding it down to very low pressures. For future sustainable locomotives, the opposite is almost true. Triple expansion combined with re-superheating allows us to take advantage of higher steam pressures, again extracting more power from the steam without exceeding the material and lubrication constraints of the engine. For example, if we adopted a steam pressure of 60 bar or 870 psi as proposed by Porter for third generation steam locomotives, to expand that steam in a simple expansion engine we would need a steam temperature of almost 600 degrees celsius to prevent condensation in the cylinders whereas just 400 degrees Celsius will achieve the same in our triple expansion engine, simplifying the design immensely. So there's been a slight change of plan, and instead of focusing all of my energy on getting the circulating pump built for the boiler, Phillips had an idea. What we're going to do is take the boiler to field days. And this is all a part of the Ag Loco project. So Field Days is a biannual event in New Zealand South Island, based quite close to here in Canterbury, and it's an opportunity for farmers to come along and learn about the latest technology on offer to help them on the farm. So it's a perfect opportunity for us to talk to farmers and learn more about what this technology can do for them, how this can help them transition away from fossil fuels and become more sustainable. So we've decided to take the Rail Loco boiler along to field days. It gives us something to show people, something to talk about, and it's quite big, so it should be noticeable, I hope. And even though this boiler is much larger than the boiler we're going to build for the first Ag Loco, we're anticipating future Ag Locos being built up to a power output of 400 horsepower. So this boiler is about the same size that a 400 horsepower Ag Loco would have on it. And when we get to that point, not only will we be building the most sustainable agricultural locomotive in the world, we'll also be building the most powerful agricultural locomotive in the world, which is quite exciting. Now to get it to field days, we've got a problem. One option is to pay someone to come in with a high ab and lift this and take it up there for us and then bring it back, but we, we just can't afford to do that. So Philip had another idea, and that was to put a truck axle underneath the frame on this boiler, which I was a bit hesitant about, but it's actually going to work out really well. So if you remember a few episodes ago, I showed you cutting hay and baling hay uh, with my father's tractor. The plan is to use that tractor with a truck axle underneath this boiler to take it up to field days and back, which is going to save us a lot of money. And it's also going to mean we can take the boiler to other locations to demonstrate it and to introduce people to advanced steam locomotive technology. And then even better, once the first Ag Loco is built, we'll be able to use that to tow this boiler around to raise awareness and build momentum for the construction of the rail loco. So yes, this does mean that the circulating pump's not going to be finished and mounted on the boiler for a little while longer, which is a bit frustrating, but the value in taking this to field days is so much greater. We also decided not to steam the boiler at field days because it added a lot of complexity and there's just not enough time between now and field days, which are being held at the end of March, to get the boiler properly prepared for steaming at the event. So along with putting the boiler on the truck axle and rolling it up to field days, I've got to do some work on promotional material, and that means spending a bit of time on design work for the Ag Loco, and producing a general arrangement of the Ag Loco that we can show at field days. Along with that, I've got to make some signs and work out how I'm going to dress the site up. It's a 12 by 15 meter site, so it's quite large. It's a bit larger than this workshop. So there's plenty of room to put stuff, uh, maybe a bit too much room. But all the same, I'm going to continue as much as possible with progress on the circulating pumps. And as soon as we get back from field days, it'll be all hands on deck, or all of my hands on deck, 
to get the circulating pump done and the boiler tested. But the other great thing I've realized about having a truck axle under the boiler is I can take it to locations that are more suitable for extended and scientific testing of the boiler, which generally makes quite a lot of noise, and I can't do that here. So once the pumps are on, I'm going to be able to extract some really good data from the boiler. A massive thank you to Philip for helping me get this axle. Philip organised the whole lot, even helping me to pick up the axle with his vehicle, and what's more, his kids came along to help too. So, massive thank you to Philip, Roman, Iris and Fife for spending a very hot day running around picking up this axle. And the trailer that we transported the axle on was lent to us by Alan. You may remember Alan from previous episodes as the mysterious man who brought along steam pump parts. So he's done all of the water jet cutting for the steam pump and he builds these amazing trailers with airbags that allow the trailer to go up and down, which made it really easy to get the axle off at this end because I haven't got a mobile lifting equipment. I haven't got a forklift. So thanks a lot, Alan. That was a big help. Someone left us a comment about lighting the boiler up using the upside down technique. Most times when we light the boiler up, we use a, a variant of that, but we always put a wee bit of wood on top. So the upside down uh, lighting up technique is you put a layer of fuel, a bit of, of wood in the fire, and then you put some smaller wood on top of that and, and even smaller kindling on top of that again. Then you put the lit rags on top of all of that and you let it burn down through and, and the idea is it gives a cleaner light up uh, because you've got hot flames on top and you haven't got smoldering bits of wood and so on but there's a lot of information about it videos on YouTube and if you want to have a look at it so upside down fire is what it's uh, generally called so I thought uh, we'd give it a go today just to see how it behaves and we're going to do it as best we can we've got some poplar to put it in the bed of the fire. With this boiler, we don't need so much wood in the base of the fire because it doesn't use much wood to get up. So we've got to be careful not to put too much in. We've got some very dry pallet wood uh, to put on top of the poplar. And then we've got some poplar twigs to put on top of that and some eucalyptus bark to put on top of that. And I think that's quite a comprehensive upside down fire. Don't you, Nico? Yeah, that should really do it, I reckon. We've put uh, just one layer of poplar uh, as the base of the fire. Got some of that pallet wood on top. And now for some of the poplar twigs. A few minutes in. It's looking a wee bit slow. So as you can see, our first try at a pure upside down light up technique didn't work out so well and we had to resort to our normal technique. But with some development, I can see value in the technique. So one thing I was concerned about was having too much fuel in the firebox and it getting away on us. But as we found out, that wasn't going to be an issue. So in the future, I'm hoping to develop this technique a bit more just to see if it does or can offer some potential. Well, that's it till next time. Thank you for watching. There's a few challenges coming up over the next few weeks to get to field days. I'm hoping I can do it. I'm sure I can. But I'll let you know how I'm getting on in the next episode. Look, a massive thank you to everyone who is supporting the project, whether that's by becoming a patron, donating directly to the project, or lending a helping hand. Thank you. If you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe and definitely check out my page on Patreon. I'd love you to join the project as a patron to help me on my mission to build the world's most sustainable locomotives using the power of steam.